On this week's episode, Falcon and the Winter Soldier turns a very dark corner. What's up ahead for Star Trek? And we recap WrestleMania. All this and more as you once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos. This is Gerald Glasser from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at Pop Culture Cosmos. It is sincerely appreciated. Well, I want to go ahead and let everyone know that Josh Peterson was scheduled to be here today, but unfortunately he could not make it in. I want to go ahead and wish him well. We're truly rooting for you out there. And I also want to go ahead and give a big shout out to Thomas Bennett, who was going to be scheduled on for last week for an interview. He was a little bit under the weather. So our thoughts are with you, my friend. I know you got recently out of the hospital this past weekend, so... Hope you're feeling better, you're up and about, and I hope you'll be able to come on the show real soon as well. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without a good friend of mine, and I got another great friend, because I seem to have a lot of great friends out there on the internet, and one of my longtime good friends out there on the internet is a good man indeed. You got to hear him on all the episodes that he's done with me for the Lakers Fast Break and Pop Culture Cosmos, and also what he did previously from Voice from the Underground. I'm sure he's got a slew of things that he's done on the internet, some of which is you could be very proud of. And then again, some of the stuff with me as well. <laughs> but it is a good man indeed. You got to check him out anytime he's here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. It is TJ Johnson. And TJ, so glad to have you back on the program again. And thank you for coming on on such short notice. Oh, absolutely, man. I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to do so. And I'm grateful that you had thought of me and invited me. I don't know how you inviting me on, like, but I mean, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to say no, but there's got to be better guests out there. You must be really scraping the bottom of the barrel right now, but <laughs> no, 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 you're always one of the first I call because oh, your insight man. and your knowledge of not only pop culture, your, your enthusiasm for pop culture also <laughs> as well for the Lakers. You know, I got to pop you on for the Lakers as much as I can, but for pop yes, culture, sir. people have been hearing your thoughts over the past few months on Falcon and the winter soldier, Mm -hmm. WandaVision, PlayStation. We've talked about a myriad of things so far in pop culture that have fascinated you. Justice League. We've talked Mm -hmm. about the Apocalypse War and all that. So there's so many things that you like about pop culture, but you're fascinated by it. And I truly love any time that you can come back on. And today's show is going to be something that we're definitely interested in because you actually reached out to me. And I wasn't sure (laughs) I was going to be able to bring you on because I'm not sure if I had enough time for you on today's program. But... We are going to be talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Episode 4, which took a very, very dark turn, and we'll explain why. There'll be spoilers coming up, so if you haven't watched it yet, please put us on pause. Let's all pause, (laughs) and go ahead and hit the play button after you go ahead and watch it, because it is a very intriguing episode indeed. Plus, also as well, we're going to be breaking down Night 1 and Night 2 of WrestleMania, Coming up after the break, it'll be John Orlando from the PVD cast who is with me to break down night one of WrestleMania. And coming up after the halfway mark, it'll be Noah Ian Fine from Honey Queen breaking down night two of WrestleMania. A momentous weekend for everyone out there. Just so thankful that we can have live events. And I'm sure the WWE is real excited in this limited capacity. But from what I've been seeing so far, it looks like they've been having a great time. And of course, the matches have been there. And we'll talk about Night one and night two coming up on the show. Plus, TJ and I will also be on the back end of the show talking about Star Trek. Why? They recently had on Paramount Plus Star Trek First Contact Day, which is a celebration of the 25th anniversary of the movie Star Trek First Contact, which is among the very best of the Star Trek movies if you're a Star Trek fan. So I'll ask TJ his thoughts on some of the announcements that were made there some of the extension of some of the series, and if the Star Trek IP is still something people should get excited for at this point in time. But first, my friend, it is 
Falcon and the Winter Soldier, episode four. It hit and it has a lot of people talking. I'm going to tell you right now, that's the first thing I notice is that when you have a show that clicks with an audience out there, whether it's for good or whether it's for bad, it's something that people are talking about. Last week, everybody was talking about Baron Zemo and his dancing skills. Doing, I think it was, <laughs> I, I call it the shaken margarita because it looked like he was shaking a margarita. You know, <laughs> you know and he was all over the place. He's actually talked about in interviews how cool it is that how funny it is that happened. <laughs> But I will say that it was something that was very enjoyable and that people were truly getting into it. This week, John Walker, who is the current Captain America, he's played by Kurt Russell's kid, Walker Russell, I believe. Walker Russell. Uh, Yeah, and at times he looks like spitting image of his dad. There's times when you (laughs) see him at certain angles, I'm like, that's Kurt's kid. But you see him now and... We talked about in episode two about how he had really come to play as far as still wanting to do good, but in a misguided fashion. And we see that all come to play in episode four. I know the episode at the beginning started around and centered around Kari Morgenthal of the Flag Smashers, the search to find her, whether it's the Power Broker or whether it's Falcon Winter Soldier or whether it's Battlestar and Captain America. All these forces seem to try to find where she's located at, Mm -hmm. but it all centers around the the super serum as well. That darn super serum, man. You just can't seem to shake it, man. You can't seem to to throw a shoe in a direction without hitting somebody that's got a super serum. Uh, Oh, excuse me, TJ. I'm going to have some (laughs) super serum right now. Hold on, please. But go ahead. Continue, my friend. (laughs) You know, I, I thought it was interesting. And once you've seen that one vial of super soldier serum left you just you you knew i mean we all knew where this was gonna go i don't think anybody who's been paying any kind of attention didn't know what john was about to do but you just you see it and you're like "Ah, not him not him there's anybody that doesn't need any superpowers any super soldier anything is this guy and you seen it and you you knew what was going to happen and i just i don't think i expected it to get as dark as it did as quickly as it did that was a quick turn but i'm sure we'll, we'll get into that well, let's go ahead and right now preface it by the search throughout <laughs> the entire episode was the search for morgenthal mm-hmm. and they finally were able to catch up with her because they knew she had possession of the last 12 bottles of super serum the, okay the last 12 bottles of super serum that we know about and basically it led to a situation where there was a fight and John Walker kept getting his butt kicked. First, he got his (laughs) butt kicked by super soldiers from the flag smashers. When John Walker and Battlestar confronted Falcon and winter soldier at one of Baron Zemo's flats with Baron Mm -hmm. Zemo, they all got their butts kicked by the Dora Milaje, which I thought was a great turn bringing them into the mix because they have issues with Baron Zemo because he killed King T'Chaka way back in Civil War. So mm-hmm. it, it's all very interesting how this all is layered in there. But he got his butt kicked again and could not deal with it. You could mm-hmm. see the anger rising. And the fact is that there was a situation that all led to all the catching up to Kari Morgenthal and the Flag Smashers, confronting them. She tried to get away. Baron Zemo, in the middle of it again, not doing a shaken margarita this time, but in the middle of it all again, He went ahead and he shot at Morgenthal. She dropped all 12 Mm -hmm. vials, which is amazing how all 12 just fall out of that fanny pack. But anyways, need I digress? (laughs) Didn't have the Rocks fanny pack. If you had the Rocks fanny pack from the night. Definitely didn't have the Rocks fanny pack. Yeah, that would have helped nicely. (laughs) But, you know, that's all over the floor. Baron Zemo smashes every one of them, he thinks. But then he gets hit by the shield and gets knocked out by John Walker, who spies one lonely vial sitting in between a couple of water bottles and he decides to keep it for his use and we didn't know if he would take it or not but he has a conversation with Battlestar and that's I think was the key as far as to what his future plans lie if you didn't know he was going to take that I mean and I appreciate you setting the table that was great but if you didn't know he was going to take that serum for himself you haven't been paying attention now okay I know he was going to take it you can tell from number one Oh yeah, the one thing we can I can tell you is that if you learn the the comic history of John Walker, you know that he actually got his powers a lot sooner than he did in this show. So we knew that it was going to happen. Now, 
people really don't like John Walker. And for good reason. I'm not going to pretend that he's a very, very lovable Captain America, considering the fact that he's following up Chris Evans, who is one of the heart and souls of the MCU. So people already just don't like him. And all the memes have shown that they don't like him. And here's why I think we, we need to give him a little bit of slack. Just a little bit. And I'm, I'm going to empathize with him for a second. That is a lofty, lofty title to live up to. A lofty title to live up to Captain America. This man has stood against Thanos, has stood against different tyrannies and has fought in different wars. And John Walker is no slouch on his own. Let's be clear. He's, he's already proven himself on the battlefield of war as well. But living up to Captain America's standards is, is very, very difficult. It has to be. I mean, I, I can't say I know for certain because I've never done it. But I'd have to imagine it's very, very difficult. And to not be a super soldier on top of that and to be getting into these fights and to already be looking to try to do right. I, I think he genuinely wanted to do the right thing. I think he genuinely wants to exceed these expectations and this pressure that's put on him to be Captain America. So I think his intentions, at least... The MCU is very good at painting different strokes for characters that we think are one-dimensional. We think characters have this one shade, and, and Marvel has been masterful, if you will, for lack of a better term, in creating these broad strokes, or these 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 more defined strokes, I should say, not broad, but defined strokes, and giving you real nuance to these characters. So I, I think John Walker is really trying, at first, to do the right thing, and he realizes he's just a man. And he doesn't have the training that Captain America had. He doesn't have the abilities that Captain America did. And I think it all kind of really came to a head as he was getting frustrated with this, the Carly situation. And when Falcon was in there trying to do his thing and he was just getting impatient, you can see, you can see this was just, it was going to boil over. It was going to get ugly. And you felt the tension rising. I think that's another great thing that Marvel is really doing with these series is that they're, they've got this way of building this pressure, building this tension. And they're doing a really great job at that. So you can see the frustration mounting. You can see his his being just ready to go. He's already amped up. He's fired up. He's ready. And he's got to try to bottle that beast. And he's having a hard time doing that. And, of course, Sam is making progress. And he's he's getting through to her. And all of a sudden, he's like, all right, time's up. I got to, nope, you're in arrest. And starts the domino effect. And the fun part was, <laughs> I seen this meme on the internet the other day. And I, I immediately thought of that episode <laughs> When he put his hand on the Dora Milaje, uh, I can't think of the, the the person from the Dora Milaje, but when he put his hand on her shoulder and said, all right, that's enough, you knew at that moment he, he messed up. You knew at that moment that he was going to get his feelings and his butt kicked. The second he put his hand on her shoulder, it was a done deal. So obviously that fight ensues and he gets handled and you got super soldiers and it, he was vastly underpowered and desperate to try to figure something out. So he takes the serum, and of course, he takes it off screen. We don't know he's taking the yeah. serum, so it gives us a chance to kind of be like, well, maybe he didn't take it, maybe he did take it. But then you see him throw that that shield, and you see it get lodged into the wall. Now, and you see him bend that pipe. And you see him bend the pipe. You see him bend the pipe, and it's like, okay, he's amped up on Super Soldier Serum. He took it. He took the triple S. The one thing that the doctor said in the original Captain America was that it enhances what you already are. Good becomes greater, bad becomes worse. And you really got a chance to see how dark John Walker can get. And that final scene after he's effectively killed that member of the Flag Smashers. Well, the whole on leading into that is because Battlestar had just killed. Battlestar was killed, killed. yes. Battlestar absolutely. was yes. captured. Battlestar frees himself sees the, the conflict going on with uh, mm -hmm. all the Flag Smashers and, of course, mm -hmm. Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Captain America, gets in the middle of the battle and, unfortunately, gets killed by Morgenthal. And that, Incidentally, like said, too. That was not on purpose. No, it was not she on purpose. Looked, she, she, you could tell she was extremely like, oh, crap, I didn't mean to do that. Like, that was not the intention whatsoever. No, but, unfortunately, when you have, like you said, the Triple S, yeah. there you <laughs> go. But, yeah, you saw it set him off and how poignant and how full circle it comes to the guy he ends up killing with the shield was a former Captain America fanboy and mm -hmm. somebody who looked mm -hmm. up to Captain America and talked about it earlier in the episode. I want to say this about the whole episode. You could see everything coming 
from 15 miles away. I mean, it, oh, yeah. it, it was not discreet about it. It <laughs> didn't give you any surprises or anything of that nature. You could see everything developing and everything going to be happening as it eventually unfolded. Still, it was great entertainment nonetheless. This was the strongest episode by far, and I'm sure it was by design. I mean, these guys at Marvel, they know what they're doing. They know to, to kind of give you a little bit and give you a little bit and give you a little bit and kind of continue to pull you in. This is definitely the strongest episode by far. This was the episode, as far as I'm concerned, that was like, okay, now the Falcon and Winter Soldiers must see television the moment it comes out. Like, it's Because not you were on a, the fence. You were on the fence. I was. I was. Absolutely. And I and I, I hold no qualms about that. I enjoyed the direction that one division took. It was just something different. And I felt like Falcon and Winter Soldiers was a little bit more of the same thing. It was too buddy copish. A lot of the jokes didn't land. I felt like the relationship, as much fun as it was in, to watch in Civil War, it just didn't really seem to hit those same notes yet. However, this one was the absolute episode where it's like, okay, this has to be watched on Friday the moment it drops because yeah. this is must-see television at this point. And the story picked up quite a bit. You didn't have so many of these quiet beats and these little jokes that aren't landing. And <laughs> they, it, it didn't feel forced. This was definitely the strongest episode by far. Not even close. Not even close. And I'm excited for episode five and six, and I know you are as well, but if anyone mm -hmm. out there wants to go ahead and share their thoughts on Falcon and Winter Soldier, the big turn for John Walker, what's going on with the Flag Smashers, are you sympathizing with them and their plight? We want to hear everything as far as your thoughts on Falcon and Winter Soldier, so please share it with us, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, coming up next, it is John Orlando from the PVD cast talking about night one of WrestleMania. Then right after that, it's Noe and Fine coming up for day two on WrestleMania. So we've got our complete WrestleMania coverage coming up for you next. And then after that, TJ and I will be on the back end talking about Star Trek and First Contact Day, what happened, and the future for the IP as well. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. For the latest news and information, analysis and opinions on the Los Angeles Lakers and the NBA, Check out the Lakers Fast Break podcast today on wherever you get your podcasts. WrestleMania 37 Night 1 is in the books and here today to talk about it on our WrestleMania Pop Culture Cosmo style post-game wrap-up for Night 1 of WrestleMania is a good man indeed. He has been on consistently for us as one of our preeminent experts on the sports entertainment world, per se, as they like to say in the WWE universe. You got to catch his show, the PVD cast, each and every time out. If you can't find it on any podcast outlet, and I don't know why you can't because it's just the PVD cast, go to the PVDcast.com. It is John Orlando, my friend. Night one is in the books. It was so funny because they kept going, one year, one month, one day since we have not been able to wrestle in front of a crowd, and we're all ready to go. And right after the America the Beautiful, it started to rain. <laughs> you know, that is, to be honest, probably the most surprising part of WrestleMania. Because, let's be honest, we have gotten so used to, oh, it's an outdoor stadium, no big deal. You know, because we've never had any major weather delays, have we, in the history no. of WrestleMania? No. That was the probably the most shocking then she part gotta of wrestle in the rain. Now, I know there's a, a fan safety issue with lightning and all that. But if it was just sure. going to be rain, wrestle in the rain. Wrestle in the rain. Yeah. Yeah, just change up how you're going to wrestle and just go that way. Exactly. Brawl in the crowd for a couple hours. That would work. <laughs> but, but it was only a half hour delay. Uh, so, the, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. But... It started off because uh, they really want to put on a showcase at the end for the ladies. And I compliment the WWE for doing that with the title match for Bianca Belair versus Sasha Banks. That was going on last. So what came up first was the WWE Raw title. That was up for grabs between Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley. I think it was something that for me was a little bit clumsy, but very physical. And I thought it was solid, but not spectacular. I would agree. I thought it was really solid. But I, I would go out on a limb and say that I think it was one of the better matches tonight. 
Yeah, uh, that, I, that may not be the best thing overall to say. That's it, true. No, it, no, was, no, it was okay for what it was. It was okay for what it was. I think they want to go a little bit more with Bobby Lashley. I don't know if he's their long-term planning, but he is their champion for now. Again, I was kind of surprised that they didn't give Drew McIntyre his signature win to see if he's someone that the company can build around. So that was kind of weird how that worked out. But you know what? If that's the way they want to go, it still leaves a lot for speculation on who is going to be the face of Raw going forward. Mm -hmm. The next matchup was a tag team turmoil match for the number one contendership for the women's tag team titles. And it was won by Tamina and Natalia. What were your thoughts on this tag team turmoil match? I mean, with all these four teams, with Billy Kane, Carmella, the Riot Squad, Lana and Naomi, what were your thoughts on this match? For me, like I said, it was unfortunately time that could have been better spent. You talk about a clumsy match. This was yeah. clumsy. There was a lot of things that were not smooth. I feel like this match would have been, if they were going to do it in the Scotland format, they should have been quick. Look, I think it's it's clearly evident that this women's tag team division is just not working. Up next was AJ Styles and Omos, even though it's spelled Omos. It's Omos, defeated Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods to win the Raw Tag Team Championships. This was a cut and dry, big man, small man type tag team. The smaller guy, AJ Styles, goes out there, works with the New Day. I knew exactly where this match was going. As soon as Michael Cole said the words, the New Day could possibly be the greatest tag team of all time. And he said it not once, not twice, but three times. Corey Graves went on there saying it too. And that's the kiss of death right there for you. You can tell once you start saying this was a standard typical match where he had big man and small man. Small man works the entire match. Big man comes in and finishes off in relatively easy fashion. I like the Omos factor. Omos seems like he's got a great presence. Is there as a showcase for Omos? I was surprised the fans popped when he got the tag and he came in. And then when he won, and I was surprised at the reaction. I was like, oh, okay. But I agree with you, Gerald. I felt that this match, it was fine for what it was. But I think they could have shortened it some. And it would have made it a little bit better if they just shortened it down just a little bit. Because, again, it made it somewhat like you knew what was going to happen. That's for a lot of WrestleMania matches. True. If you can make it shorter, two to five minutes shorter on a lot of these matches, not only tonight, but as a whole, you know, maybe you could go ahead and make a lot better quality matches. But this is something that was not unexpected. I will say this, Gerald. I think one match that we, I think, probably are going to talk about next, I would go for an extra two or five minutes, and that was Cesaro and Seth Rollins. That match was fantastic. Well, that came up next, and that match was the best match of the night. I do want to put the last match right along with it. I thought that was a great match as well, but I think that was the best match of the night. I kind of liked it where it was at as far as the, the amount of minutes because they were pulling off so many unique moves. And this Seth Rollins reminds me of the pre-knee injury Seth Rollins where he was doing a lot of unique and fantastic offense when he had his, I think, first or second run as world champion just before he, he tore up his knee And he was doing things that nobody else on the planet was doing. And he was being called the best worker on the planet at that point in time. And to his credit, he did some sensational things. Cesaro was right there with him. But it did lead to the spot with the, I don't know if it was 22. I think Michael Cole was counting very quickly on that one. But it was not 23 (laughs) Giants. It's more like 18 to 20, I think, is what I saw. But even if that's the case, after the big giant swing of rotations 20 plus times or whatever, he did go ahead and pin Seth Rollins. And I'm very happy for Cesaro. And Cesaro needed this, obviously, to put Mm -hmm. him in a spotlight after all these years. I know Seth Rollins is still going to be coming around and getting some type of push at some point in time when they get back around to him. But for me, I think, again, it was the best match of the night and a showcase for both of these guys. I agree. And and like I said, I would have loved to have a few more minutes, but it was fine the way it was because they were pulling out all the stops. They were working hard. To me, I'm saying this was the best match of the night. Coming up next after that was the steel cage match between Braun Strowman and Shane McMahon. It was there 
It was not unexpected. Shane McMahon did his requisite bump from the top of the cage, which everybody in their grandmother was expecting. And it led to a victory for Braun Strowman, which was not also unexpected. Again, this was a match that I think was unnecessary. And unfortunately, it went 11 minutes too long. Not two to five minutes, but it went 11 minutes too long. I was surprised that the bump Shane McMahon took was not more extreme. Because I think in previous years, he's done some crazy stuff. Yeah. And so for me what bump he did take, which was kind of like, if you will, a hip toss kind of body slam type of throw from the top of the cage. I was like, well, that hurt. No doubt. I'm not saying it didn't hurt, but I was like, "Mm, he's done worse. So I guess I didn't know what to expect with this match. Yeah. I feel like the bloom is off the rose when it comes to Braun Strowman. I don't think he's getting a, a serious run with any title soon. This is a match that'd be fine for maybe King of the ring or, Maybe even SummerSlam, but keep it off of WrestleMania. I think that should be something that's going to bring in fans. And Shane McMahon doing a wild bump is not going to bring in fans anymore. I think it's done. It's over with. And I think at some point in time, Vince McMahon should probably say, I think I need to take my son off this big moment. Yeah, agreed. The next match was the match that kind of surprised me in ways. And that was Damian Priest and Bad Bunny who defeated The Miz and John Morrison. So I want to hear your thoughts. It was a great performance by Bad Bunny. He looked like he was being coached very, very well. But your thoughts on this as a, I guess, a showcase for Damian Priest and to see if he can give you anything going forward. Oh, well, and I think he was the one that was overshadowed in this match. We saw nothing from Damian Priest for about three-fourths of that match. If this is a showcase for Damian Priest, then they totally dropped the ball and they messed this all up. I agree. I was impressed that Bad Bunny... Didn't look as bad as I thought he would in the ring. I want to go ahead and say again, Bad Bunny, I'm surprised he did so well, but they gave him a lot. And Ms. Morrison, in doing so, has even less believability as a tag team. If it was supposed to be a showcase for Damian Priest going forward, I don't think they got it. No. And then last but not least was a very, very solid match, which I enjoyed with Bianca Belair defeating Sasha Banks. And I give Sasha Banks all the credit for not only allowing Bianca Belair to get the pin, but allowing her to look very good in doing so. She wins the SmackDown Women's Championship. Just a great performance by both ladies. I thought it was a very, very solid match. For me, it was second best match of the night. And I think they deserve the spot as the main event in 9-1. And I think this match earned it for them. I thought the match was really good. Again, we talk about showcasing people. I think this is a great showcase for Bianca Belair. While I am not a fan of the character, I'm not. I would just say that right out of the gate. She did a heck of a job. But before we hand on out, my friend, your thoughts on night one overall? For night one, I feel like this was an okay WrestleMania. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's been just so great talking to my friend. Once again, it's John Orlando from the PVD cast. I'm still looking forward to a great night, too. I know I'll have Noah Ian Fine from the Hunnigal cast here to do wrap up night two with me. But before we head on out, my friend, I want you to give a big plug for your show, the PVD cast, what you've been up to with it and what you got that people can look forward to <laughs> wherever they get their podcasts. It's really funny that we're talking about WrestleMania because last Thursday I dropped the WrestleMania preview show involving myself and a couple of friends, DJ Joey Blaze and Ringside Rand talking about our predictions for tonight and for tomorrow night. And, how'd they go, uh, by the way? How'd they go? Uh, how'd they go? Actually, I started off being the one with the most correct predictions, but by night's end, it's kind of, it's all evened out. So we're, there, no one has a big, big advantage or a big, big winning percentage, so to speak, so far. So we'll see if that trend continues. Of course, we're going to do a wrap-up show as well this week. But prior to that, some conversations with some Absolutely fascinating guest, George Stover, who was a uh, independent actor who's worked a lot with John Waters and Don Doler in Maryland. He sat down with me and we talked about his nearly five decades in independent filmmaking. Had a lot of great guests over the past few weeks. So check it out at pvdcast.com or wherever you find podcasts. You can find it there. Just type in pvdcast and you should be able to find it at all those places like Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. Well, John, it's been a okay night one. 
Not exactly what the WWE should have been looking for, but maybe the rain was the ominous sign for it. But you know what? I'm looking forward to an even better night two at WrestleMania. And we'll be back right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. If you want to see the coolest action figure collections out there, the stuff that you played with as a kid, hear from industry insiders that made the toys that really, truly defined who we are, then you got to check out Season 1 of Action Figure Adventure. Check out Action Figure Adventure now, exclusively at Big Bad Toy Store. You'll get 10 episodes of awesome action figure fun. I guarantee if you grew up playing toys, you will love Action Figure Adventure. All right, and we're back with the program. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. It is night two of WrestleMania, and that is in the books. And WrestleMania as a whole is done for this year in 2021. We had a lot of championship title changes. Some of it deserved, some of it not. But that's another story altogether, and that would take too long to explain because I've already probably gone on that diatribe before. One too many times, but it was WrestleMania Night 2, and here today to talk about WrestleMania Night 2 is a good man indeed. You got to follow him anywhere you can at Hunnic Outcast and Hunnic Queen on Facebook. It is Noah and Fine, and Noah, I know it's late for you, my friend. I know you stayed up for it. In fact, that's pretty much par for the course now with WrestleManias these days, but it was the weekend that was for WrestleMania. Night 2 is in the books, but I appreciate you joining me here today. And this is a part I can stay up all night long for. At the time, WrestleMania is not what it used to be. We'll get into the matches right now. Mm. First up on the list was Randy Orton and The Fiend in a feud which I was hoping would go away a lot sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But hopefully that they could go ahead and after tonight move on to bigger and better things. But Randy Orton, after a short match, yeah, I guess it was okay for what it was, defeated The Fiend. The Fiend got distracted by Alexa Bliss, who came out of the -the jack-in-the-box, which he originally came out of, had some black goo coming all over her face and all over her body and all that stuff, trying to look all creepy and stuff. My friend, again, it was for the match itself. It was all right for what it was. It's something like I think you should have put on TV personally, but I'm not into the Fiend gimmick at all. I really think that Alexa Bliss is better served being one of the preeminent women in the women's wrestling division. She's extremely popular with the fans. It turned out, again, a loss for The Fiend because Randy Orton did hit him with the RKO, something that I expected to hopefully blow off this feud once and for all. The best thing about the match was the opening. The rest of it, I just didn't care too much about. The black glue, I thought, was kind of distasteful, especially with everything that's going on in the world today. As for the match, this is an opening match. doesn't say much. I gave this like one and a half stars. Want to go ahead into the next match, which took seemingly forever to go ahead and finish. I think this would have been a nice, hard-hitting match in about three to five minutes. Instead, they dragged this out to 14 minutes. And that was the women's tag team title match between Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, who were the champions. They defeated Tamina and Natalia, who won the previous night on night one of WrestleMania in a number one contender's gauntlet match. They won over Tamina and Natalia. Tamina and Natalia, I guess, are the strongest contenders, but still, they're not overwhelming with the fans. And right now, it just looks like it's going to be Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler on top of the women's tag team division for some time to come. If your thoughts horrible, are not- horrible. Just zero. Just move on. Horrible. <laughs> horrible. Zero stars. It was not an impressive match. It did drag quite a bit for me, and it was probably the worst match of the evening. But the next match that came up was Kevin Owens facing off against Sami Zayn with Logan Paul sitting there at ringside doing nothing until the very end because you know they had to go ahead and do something with him so that he would earn his money because I know he's probably being paid a lot. But... Kevin Owens, after a, a okay match, it was a, it was a nice match for what it was. Defeated Sami Zayn. Uh, this is something that goes back to their days in the independent scene, as far as how much they know each other, or how much they worked each other, and you could tell they were very familiar with their with each other's work. And it was very smooth for what it was. I really appreciated the work that was in there. They both worked hard, and again, it just ended up with Kevin Owens hitting the stunner for the one, two, three, and of course at the end. 
He has to go ahead and get Logan Paul with a stunner too. Nothing really special about this match. All the storylines and things of that nature were not really very interesting. But your thoughts on Kevin Owen versus Sami Zayn? A good solid match, but nothing more. Another zero stars. I didn't care for either. I, I'm not a Kevin Owens fan. Sami Zayn deserves more. Logan Paul I don't care for. And in all honesty, again, this was a blah match. It should have been the opening match. And it was just a, there was nothing to it. It was... Fast, quick, in a hurry, and that's my opinion on this one also. When it comes down to WrestleMania as a whole, you have a lot of filler matches, and that's what we were seeing a lot of times was a lot of these filler matches that would probably be better suited on a stage set for Mondays or Fridays. Sheamus is in the next match against Riddle for the United States Championship. Matt Riddle, who you can only call by Riddle with his original bro, dude bro concept. It was a... Pretty physical match. It reminded me in a lot of ways of the opening match yesterday in day one. Very physical, a little clumsy at times. They missed some spots. They slipped up a couple times, but it was very physical. I kind of liked that aspect. And at the very end, they had a great finish where Riddle was trying to do a flip off the ropes. And he caught a broke kick from Sheamus right in the face and actually got cut up in the mouth because of it. And... Sheamus defeated Riddle to win the United States Championship. I don't know. They keep on giving the title to Sheamus for every reason under the sun. But again, he doesn't move the needle in any shape or form. He's had many opportunities and has really done nothing for the product. Riddle doesn't seem like he's going ahead and getting everybody excited there either. But I want to hear your thoughts on Sheamus versus Riddle. Sheamus, I actually have a soft spot for. Sadly, this is a one and a half because I'm pushing the needle towards Sheamus. There are times he's got chemistry. I like the early Sheamus when he first came in. I know he was a Shawn Michaels and Triple H's guy back in the day. So I know why they keep giving him the championship. I just think he needs a more worthy opponent. He had a great feud with Cena when he first debuted. Since then, I don't think they really know who to book Sheamus with. That's worthy of the Celtic Warrior. Well, the Celtic Warrior come out with the victory with the U.S. Championship. Like I said, I like the ending of it. They worked hard, physical match, but a lot of slip-ups, very clumsy. Again, it reminded me of night one with Drew McIntyre versus Bobby Lashley. It could have been something much more special had they not had so many mess-ups. But the next match after that was a Nigerian drum fight with Apollo Crews versus Big E for the Intercontinental Championship. This was a surprise to me. I really thought they were going to stick with Big E. I thought the company had a lot of great intentions in mind for Big E. But Apollo Crews, after interference from a unknown giant, so we don't know who that is right now. He doesn't have a name yet attached to him or any type of identity as of yet. But the unknown giant came in at the end, hit Big E with a choke slam, and, well, basically that was all she wrote as – the match ended as a 1-2-3 for Apollo Crews. Your thoughts on this Nigerian drum fight between Apollo Crews and Big E? Well, it definitely drummed up my interest, pardon the pun. Yeah, it was no, no disqualification, no count out. But Big E has never really gotten the respect that he deserves. I think that he should be up there with Coffee Kingston. It's nice he's doing singles. It's nice he's in turn on New Day. They want to pass the torch to Apollo Crews. I just want to see... What these guys can do, I'm sure we're going to get a rematch in the next pay-per-view. But out of all the matches so far, this one was the best. I'm going to give this one a two and a half. Yeah, I give it around the same thing. I think Apollo Crews, he's got great size and athleticism. He's got a nice future ahead of him. Congratulations to him. He is now the Intercontinental Champion. But I was kind of surprised that the Big E train seemingly has stalled as of now. The next match after that was a match that I knew was going to happen, but I'm very disappointed in happening, and that was Rhea Ripley versus Asuka for the Raw Women's Championship. Rhea Ripley came in like a house of fire. It was a really good match, and I think it was, for me, the best match of the night. And unfortunately for me, Rhea Ripley defeated Asuka to win the championship. Like I said, not unexpected. I'm going to play devil's advocate and give this one a three and a half. This is the second best match. It's a lot better what they did with WrestleMania. But three and a half is still really good. So, yeah. Yes. 
I, I love them both. I, I really think that Rio Ripley deserved the championship. Asuka, I don't think that the bookers know what to do with her at times. I don't I think agree. Vince I don't think Vince McMahon really knows what he has when you got Asuka on your side. These are really talented superstars. However, if you have to pass the torch, the good news is there was no outside interference. Yeah. That's the and, biggest. And Rhea Ripley is, let me get this straight, Rhea Ripley is an extremely Very talented, talented yes. yes. Extremely talented yes. individual. Yes. And, yes. and I'm not sliding her in the least, but the fact is, when you set up Asuka in the past few weeks, it made her weaker and weaker and weaker. And she's given a lot for this company, including her front teeth, courtesy of Shayna Baszler. I think you owe it to her to go ahead and have her keep the title for a little bit longer. I'm not expecting her to keep it long anyways, because you got Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch right around the corner. In fact, I'm assuming that they were there somewhere in Tampa because the COVID restrictions, I think, were off for Charlotte Flair. And I heard rumors that Becky Lynch was there in town anyways. So I know that they're lurking right there around the corner. And you're going to give the title back to one of them at some point in time. Uh, uh, Simple as that. Uh, well, I'm, t- it's, I'm tired. I'm tired of Charlotte Flair. Other than well, I'm just going to tell Flair. you. Yeah, I, I well. understand. I, I understand. But you're, you're, I'm just saying that they're there right, lurking around the corner. And I get that. But I think you should have kept it on her a little bit longer. Maybe even given a rematch to Rhea Ripley. We give her the win in August. But. Again, that's neither here nor there. It was still a very, very good match. Three and a half stars. I agree with you on that. I think that's, for me, it was just eked out above the main event of the evening, I think, for me. But it's still a very, very, very good match by both ladies. They worked hard, tremendous work, and it was not unexpected that Rhea Ripley won. So there you go. She is the new Raw Women's Champion. And that leads us into our main event of the evening, which was Edge versus Roman Reigns versus daniel bryan yes 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 no no no. the (laughs) for the universal championship or basically the friday title we got to call this thing the monday title and the friday title because that's what they're relegated to because that's what this company is all about but it, it was the friday title the universal championship with roman reigns in what i expected and i was surprised that he was not the betting favorite going in But Roman Reigns did defeat Edge and Daniel Bryan and looked dominant in doing so and got a lot of help from Jey Uso, a lot of interference, which to me was the difference right there. Way too much interference by Jey Uso. And with all that stuff going on, and I understand it was no disqualification too, but yes, after a couple concertos, one by Edge on Daniel Bryan and one by Roman Reigns on Edge, and then one, two, three, right there you go for Roman Reigns. Edge looks old, man. I'm just going to say it out loud. Mm. Edge looks old. You can see it on his face. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people had him as a betting favorite. I know Thomas Bennett, get well. Thomas, uh, hope you get better soon. I know he was your favorite going in there, but he looked old. And I'm not sure you really wanted to go ahead and drop the title on him. But for me, it was going in Roman Reigns. You want to keep him strong as a bad guy. And I think they did just that. Roman Reigns for reasons, again, I don't like him as a face. I don't like him as a heel. Paul Heyman advocating because they still have Paul Heyman under contract, whether it's him or Brock Lesnar. It's getting really boring. It's not the same as it was 10 years ago. And as for outside interference of Jay Uso, no, this championship is like a fruit roll-up. I just don't care for it. And in all honesty, is Edge old? Well, you know, the years have not been good to him, but why come back from an injury to get injured again where you can be knocked down at any time? It, it, it's a lot better than last year's WrestleMania with his match, but that's because they didn't tape it and edit it the way that they did for this year because of the interference alone, uh, 0.5. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was pretty, But there, no. again, there was way too much interference for my taste. Mm-hmm. Your overall thoughts before we head on out on WrestleMania weekend. I don't know what else to say. I mean, other than the fact that this time it was live, this is one of the worst WrestleManias in the books. I give this WrestleMania total of one and a half stars. The worst. Mine is a little bit higher. I think I'm going two to maybe two and a half. So for me, there were some pretty good moments again. And there's also some pretty bad moments, just like every WrestleMania. But it was WrestleMania two-night event. And I'm hoping... In the future, they will reconsider their options. For me, it was a much easier watch 
because it wasn't seven hours. And for me, I think it was a lot better that way. Once again, it's Snowy and Fine. He's back from Honey Queen. Check him out for, at Honey Queen or the Honey Outcast on Facebook today. And Noah, it's been just so tremendous having you here. I know this did not get you excited, but I appreciate your honesty as always. And I look forward to speaking to you in the coming weeks about all the great things that are going on in pop culture. Falcon and Winter Soldier is still going on strong. I know we'll talk about that in the near future right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis. And we're back to end the show. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. It's Gerald along with my good friend, Mr. TJ Johnson. TJ, recently, last week, Paramount Plus, I know if you still have it or if anybody out there watches it, (laughs) which is part of the problem, which we'll talk about here in a sec, They recently celebrated First Contact Day, which is the 25th anniversary of Star Trek First Contact, the movie which is considered by many to be one of the best of the Star Trek movies that hit the theaters. I agree with them. I think it's pretty good. I think it's one of the better ones. It's not my favorite, but it's probably in my top five. They announced a whole bunch of things, and they showed off some trailers. Star Trek Discovery showed a little bit of that. That's coming out later this year. Star Trek Lower Decks, their animated show, which I truly enjoyed and truly got into. They got already renewed for season three, and season two hasn't even debuted yet, so that's great news for them. They talked about Star Trek Strange New Worlds. That's the one that's coming later. They just started production on that. That's coming, I think, probably in early 2022 at this point in time. Then they also talked about Picard. The big news with Star Trek Picard is when season two arrives around the arrival of Q. And if everybody remembers John Delancey's portrayal of Q, who is the omnipotent being that plagued John Luke Picard and the crew of the Star (laughs) Trek Next Generation for so many years on that series. So he'll be making a return, which I know a lot of people are enjoying when it comes to Star Trek Picard. They also talked about Star Trek Prodigy, which is a children's series that's going to be on Nickelodeon. That's going to feature Kate Mulgrew, who was Captain Janeway of Star Trek Voyager. I watched a couple seasons of that, so it was it was a pretty good show. So she's coming back for that in an animated form. And they also talked about the movie, which they've commissioned one of the Voyager writers. And her name is Kalinda Vasquez. She's been commissioned by Paramount to write a Star Trek movie. Is it going to be the one that's going to debut in the summer of 2023 as it's scheduled now? We're not quite sure. We think it is, but we're not 100% sure. And I know TJ's first question is, are they going to continue with the Kelvin timeline, which has our current stars, like a.k.a. Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, John Chu, Zoe Saldana, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody knows right now. (laughs) We talked about a Chris Hemsworth possible deal, whether we ended back in time to save him because he was Chris Pine's father, which is, you know, it has all that Marvel thing that going on there, kind of weird. But they talked about that and that got nixed. They talked about uh, Quentin Tarantino's movie. And that was, that looked like it was on the board. It was going to be an R rated Star Trek. And people were really liking that. That got nixed by Paramount. So now we have supposedly another film coming to the big screen in 2023. I want to hear your thoughts on Star Trek. I mean, you're probably like me. I'm not a huge Trekkie. I'm a good Trekkie. I'm considered the Star Trek fan as far as the the hosts are concerned. I am a good Star Trek fan. I'm not a great Star Trek fan. I want to ask your thoughts on the IP itself, where it stands. I mean, it's had some issues over the years. And the fact that Mm -hmm. it's on Paramount Plus, even though that's going to be a huge part of Paramount Plus, the problem is it's still all on Paramount Plus. Yeah, so I I think I'm I'm falling into the same category with you, Gerald. I am not a huge Trekkie. I will admit that 
back in my day, you had to pick a side. You had to pick either Star Wars or Star Trek. You couldn't really be both. And I picked Star Wars. I mean, it has layers of swords. It has galactic space battles. I mean, how could you not pick Star Wars? But with that being said, I will admit that some of the best sci-fi movies that I've watched were Star Trek ones. And I, I say that because the recent ones, the Calvin timeline with Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, Zoe Saldana as Carl Urban, as Gerald mentioned earlier, as you mentioned, the very, very first, I was hooked from the first scene. The first scene where, where Chris Hemsworth uh, fa- uh, the, as the father of, of... One of the best openings of all best time. Best openings of all time. I mean, I put it right up there with the opening of Mass Effect 2. Yeah. Um, it is easily one of the best openings of all time. I could watch that now and still not get weepy, but get like, God, dog, man, that's deep. You know, you were captain for a whole 10 minutes. and you People want to know how he got Thor. Check out that first that's 10 minutes. Of the, yeah, that's how he got Thor. That's how he got it, man. The range he was able to show, the elation, the concern, the, the determination, the grit, all in 10 minutes. I learned everything I needed to learn about his character in 10 minutes. That was pretty well done. So with that being said, uh, I became a huge fan of the Kelvin timeline. Everything about the Kelvin timeline is what I wanted to 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 watch so star trek the first one star trek in the darkness i can't think what the third star trek was was it star like a star trek the third see that's the problem though but that's 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 the that's the problem that's the problem they've never been able to hit on the theaters to the extent of what their star wars movies are even though this past decade or i'll say the past 15 years who has the better movies who has the better quality movies Mm -hmm. and the problem is you'd have to say star trek but who is Star Trek, you know, when it comes to Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, Star Trek Beyond, mm-hmm. which came out in 2016. Mm-hmm. That's the one. I mean, if you're able to match those up against the rebooted trilogy for Star Wars, you clearly say it was Star Trek on a quality yep. basis. But yep. who ends up with the dollars? Who ends up yep. with the popularity? The mm-hmm. thing is, there's been no Star Trek movie, I think, that's ever gained over $500 million worldwide. Mm-hmm. And that's a problem I have that they're not able to connect with a large enough audience. So I want to hear your thoughts with this. And that's the Star Trek IP as a whole. They've done great on television. You see that broad base of shows that actually they got the jump on ahead of Star Wars mm-hmm. and the Mandalorian because Discovery was been a, a good hit for them. Even though it's never translated on broadcast television, it's been a huge hit for them when it was CBS All Access. And then it, it's now migrated into Paramount+. Plus. And you see they now added Picard and yeah. Strange New Worlds and all these yeah. other shows in the Star Trek yeah. universe. It still has a place in our society and in our pop culture, but how big can it actually be? The truth is it has a place. I think it's big that they're getting a, a show on Nickelodeon. I think that's going to be huge because what I really feel in my heart of hearts is that it doesn't resonate with the younger audience. Again, it doesn't have lightsabers it doesn't have a mystical force it doesn't have any of that that other uh, shakespearean theater if you will that star wars does possess star wars has drama you know i am your father you know there's that there's drama with star wars there's incredible fighting it's like there's so much of things that the younger generation is going to dig into as the older generation we're going to enjoy the story we're going to enjoy Uh, exploring strange new worlds but when i think of star trek i think it can't be william shatner i think of beam me up scotty like those are the kind of things that remind me of star trek and let's not say that that's bad but it just doesn't resonate with the younger generation and i think the problem is because it doesn't resonate with the younger generation it loses its relevancy now them having a show coming on nickelodeon i think it's going to be a big deal but i think the ip in itself is just much more geared towards an, an older audience. And I think the sooner they realize that and the sooner they kind of change what their expectations are for that IP, I think the better off they're going to be. I, truth be told, you're, you're not catching Star Wars. It's too popular. Even when they don't hit, they hit. There's just no catching Star Wars train. Like, for instance, um, The Last Skywalker. Yeah. That movie was terrible. Movies, By all intents and purposes. Yeah. But it still made a billion dollars worldwide at the box office. Now, mind you, that's 50% of what The Force Awakens made, but that's still a billion yeah. dollars, yeah, which is something that, <laughs> yeah, which is still 50% above what any Star Trek movie has ever made mm-hmm. worldwide. I mean, as far as the shows are concerned, yeah, they're deep. 
they're insightful they have a lot of drama but you have to know what's going on within the realm of the star trek universe to get in with it exactly. star wars is a little bit more cut and dry and you're right about reaching a new audience i mean this is something josh and i have talked about where we weren't sure that it was still resonating with a younger audience and the fact is okay you've got us at this age exactly. you've already got us you need yep. to get tj your kids you need to yep. get my kids involved and yep. invested in it. so it you know that's should be the goal for disney each and every time out and i think they've done that with the mandalorian and obviously mm -hmm. the tie-in with grogu aka baby yoda that's mm -hmm. how they're able to go ahead and resonate i mean i go by costco which you are very familiar with and there's that area where they've got the big huge plushies for the different yep. disney characters and i go by there every time there's only a few left each and every time out. And what are all the ladies who are all there trying to go ahead and dig through for? They're all Baby digging Yoda. through for Baby Yoda. <laughs> uh, and this has not happened just once. This has happened no, four times time. I've been there. Yep. And the thing is that they've actually caught on to something that has resonated with a younger audience so that yep. they, in future generations, will still appreciate the Star Wars IP. We yep. haven't seen that yet from Star Trek. It's just not designed that way. I mean, again, I, I hate to keep beating on the same horse, but they have laser swords. Like, what kid doesn't want to play with a laser sword? They are by design headed towards our younger generation because that's just that's fun. And then you already hooked the older generation because now we're watching this stuff on Disney Plus and we get the, the little Easter eggs that we have with Luke Skywalker coming out down the hallway. And it's you already have us as the older generation hooked. Yeah. So as you alluded to, now you have to get the younger generation. And how does Star Wars get the younger generation? By introducing a cute baby Yoda. By it's still introducing lightsabers and still having these space galactic battles and, and TIE fighters and, and battlefront games. And they're still appealing to a younger audience. While I appreciate that Star Trek is trying to branch out now and getting on Nickelodeon and, and having all the different iterations of Star Trek, it still feels like my dad's show. Yeah. It doesn't feel like my show. It feels like my dad's show. It's just by design, not as fun as Star Wars. So that's why I like what you said about the Prodigy show, Star Trek mm -hmm. Prodigy going to Nickelodeon being a key for their future going forward. The Lower Decks is animated, but it's adult animated, so you really mm -hmm. can't show the kids that. But right. the Star Trek Prodigy, I think, could be a serious key for their future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... The, you know, there's a saying that the children are the future. Well, that means you need to get to them. You need to get to them young. And right now, you got to catch them at the, the young, young stages because as they grow, their attention span is going to be pulled to things that are really cool. And lightsabers will always be cool. I've always wanted a lightsaber since I can remember a lightsaber. And I will always want a lightsaber till the day I die. So <laughs> lightsabers will always be cool. Always. Photon guns and that's pretty standard sci-fi stuff at this point. So it's just not really sticking out. Well, set your phasers on stun and beam me up. <laughs> but I will ask you this, everyone out there, what are your thoughts on the Star Trek brand at this point in time? I mean, it's, uh, it's something I like to check in year after year because I still am a good fan of Star Trek. I'm not a Trekkie per se, but I am still a good fan of Star Trek. And I want to know if you are interested in the universe of Star Trek moving forward. Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, I want to thank so much John Orlando from the PVD cast and Noah Ian Fine from Honey Queen for stopping by on today's show, but also a huge thank you to you, TJ, for being on at such short notice. Also want to send our get well wishes <laughs> to Thomas Bennett and also as well a special prayer out there to my good friend Josh Peterson, hoping he'll come back with us as soon as he can, but my friend, it's been a fabulous episode. I cannot thank you enough for joining me on short notice. Any last thoughts on the way out? Ah, oh, you ask this every time, and every time I'm never prepared. But uh... oh, I, I know that's the thing. <laughs> I, I, I do that to all the. I do that to Josh. I do that to Marcus. I do that to all the hosts. Oh my goodness, you turkey! Final thoughts, sir. You know what? There's a lot going on. Just make sure that you're taking the time to love yourself. Take the time to love yourself. It's okay. You know, we, you can press pause on a podcast. You can press pause on a movie. You can press pause in a video game, but you can't press pause in life at times. So it's really important that you stop when you can. Take a moment, recollect, 
it's okay to stay home every now and then. It's okay to say, you know what, not tonight. I just need some time. Just make sure you're taking care of yourself. That's important. Sounds good to me. Well, my friend, it's been great having you on the show once again. I'm looking forward to next week with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. There's so much more coming up in the world of pop culture, and I hope everyone gets a chance to follow us right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for TJ Johnson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the Pop Culture Cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself. Oh, great.